Okay, uh, I think we'll get started now. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. This is uh, the last speaker in our departmental seminar series. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Joan Duffgarden. She did her PhD and master's at Harvard University and has been at uh, Stanford now for over 30 years. She uh, attempted to retire from Stanford, but the work kept came coming after her. She moved her life to Hawaii and then now found herself as adjunct professor at the University of Hawaii, where she's doing some work out there now. Um, Joan Rothgard is well known, of course. She's published nearly 200 peer review articles, um, has written eight different books, uh, some the textbook in the field, and others more popular reading, like Evolution's Rainbow and uh, the uh, Congenial Gene, which is a play on the da Dawkins' Selfish Gene book, right? Um, she's also uh, the speaker in tonight's Science and Faith seminar series uh, as well. She's written a book on um, evolution and uh, Christian uh, faith. And, an evolutionary biologist's uh, perspective. So if you're around tonight, please join us for that as well. Uh, today she's talking about uh, her idea of social selection, which she is posing as an alternative to the concept of sexual selection. So with that, John, please. Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to visit. It's a, go a gorgeous day. I think I was once in South Dakota many years ago in the, bad, in the Badlands, and so I feel though is I'm almost a first time visitor and it's uh, lovely to be here and meet so many interesting people. And what I'd like to talk to you about today uh, at the department seminar is uh, my idea and my hypotheses for um, how to replace the theory of sexual selection with some alternative hypotheses. And as some of you may know, I've already written uh, quite a bit that's been critical of sexual selection, and I'd rather not uh, offer a seminar which is primarily a critique of sexual selection, but instead to concentrate on the work my lab has done um, to replace sexual selection. Now, some of you may think that it's not necessary to replace sexual selection, that it's all fine and dandy the way it is, but um, maybe it isn't, and maybe it's worth... Uh, considering some alternative takes. Now, there are two main ways in which the idea of social selection that we've been working on in my lab differs from sexual selection. And it reverses, basically reverses the logic of sexual selection in two regards. Typically, sexual selection uh, begins with, with the genetic analysis of the conditions under which uh, a behavior is at, e is at equilibrium. So the, the typical approach to modeling behavior in sexual selection and evolutionary but, and in behavioral ecology is um, tr traces prime to the work, the important work of John Maynard Smith and his introduction of the idea of the evolutionarily stable strategy. And uh, Maynard Smith, uh, developed the criterion for uh, the equilibrium of uh, genetic strategies. And according to the criterion that a strategy could only, that, that an equilibrium was characterized by a situation where each strategy could not increase when rare given the condition, of, given the other strategy. Now, uh, this leads to a top-down method of inference. Uh, a condition for evolutionary equilibrium is developed first, and then its implications for behavior are deduced. And in the social selection perspective, we start with the behavior itself, and then we aggregate over the behavior and arrive at an evolutionary statement. So the first way in which social selection differs from sexual selection is in the direction of inference from the individual to the population rather than from the population to the individual. And in this sense, it's consistent <coughs> with modeling in ecology, which is so-called individual-based modeling, in which the properties of the population are built up from the individual, is contrasted with the approach that was certainly popular 40 years ago, in which you write down an equation for population dynamics and sort of imagine how that would trickle down to the properties of individuals. So the logistic equation, for example, would be a model of, a of 
population model proposed at the population level to begin with, and then interpreted in terms of individual performance. And certainly the approach in uh, population biology for the last decade or so has been to start with the properties of the individual and then to build up to the population. And we're doing that same thing with respect to behavior, starting with the individual and moving up. Now the second way you know, that um, social selection differs from sexual selection, and I'll talk about this more toward the middle of the talk, is in the direction of the inference from mating to reproduction. Now typically in sexual selection, you start out with thinking about what's involved in finding a mate, and then you go forward to uh, how the offspring are reared, if you ever get that far. Most of the focus on sexual selection is in the mating episode itself, as though mating was what was important. And in social selection, we start with the offspring and the conditions under which the offspring are reared and work back to mating and view mating as uh, the episode that uh, is necessary to set up the social infrastructure in which the offspring are reared. So the direction of inference is from the end of the life cycle toward the beginning of the life cycle, working backwards. And this is what's done in life history theory in ecology in which you, for example, if you were trying to model the time at which a plant ought to flower, you'd start with the end of the growing season and work back to the time, uh, and compute the optimal time to switch allocate, uh, photosynthetic allocation from pr producing vegetative material into producing seeds. So the standard method of computing an optimal life history strategy would be to start at the end and to work back toward the beginning. In the social selection perspective, uh, mating is just an episode in the life history. And so we would take the approach of life history analysis to studying mating and start at the end and work toward, work toward the mating from the end. And um, so, those two, that's the fundamental way that social selection differs from sexual selection. And in, in it re completely reverses the direction of inference. And the phrase social selection is taken from the idea of social infrastructure. So when I coined the phrase, I was thinking at the time, that it was coined in about 2004 when Evolution's Rainbow came out, and coined it thinking of developing, of selection with respect to developing the infrastructure. And I almost called it infrastructure selection, but that sounded too cumbersome, so I used the phrase social selection. And I discovered subsequently that the phrase social selection was in already in somewhat wide usage from several, several different authors. And so it has a, uh, there's a taxonomy of different meanings that the word social selection has. And many behavioral ecologists know of the work of uh, Mary Jane West Eberhard, who also uses the term social selection occasionally. And she uses it more or less interchangeably with social competition and has a very different idea. And I, I've spoken with Mary Jane about this and actually apologize for inadvertently using the same phrase that she used, but I have a very different concept in mind. She didn't seem to be particularly concerned, I might add, which is nice. So um, let me explain how the, uh, the setup goes for the direction of inference from individual behavior to uh, uh, the population's behavior. Now this is a picture here of uh, what we have in mind with a so-called two-tier setup. So we're imagining that the evolutionary process for behavior is modeled in terms of two tiers or two levels. The, the lower level is illustrated by these children playing chess. This is a picture of a chess tournament. And there are lots of tables here, each of which has a pair of children uh, playing chess with one another. And so to us, uh, each table right here would be analogous, so to speak, to a bird's nest or to a little site at which two animals are interacting with each other. And this could be a male and a female. And the eggs that they are rearing could be the uh, right here in the center of the board. 
And then, so at the behavioral tier, what we do is model the dynamics of a small party of two of a pair of individuals, or maybe a triple of individuals, just a few. And that's, this modeling takes place on a very fast time scale. So the, we're envisioning that uh, the dynamics occurs hour by hour, day by day, within the growing season. And the population, however, consists of a whole collection of these pairs or triples or quartets. So each one of these could be a little family, for example. And the game being played would be the game being played within the family. Then you sum up over all of the families, over all of the pairs, and get the population dynamics of the whole population. And that's the evolutionary tier. And so the way to model the, or the evolution of social behavior is to, according to our approach, is to start at the individual level and build up to the population level. Now, a couple other things. In a chess tournament, for example, the two individuals are playing with one another as opponents. And this would be, each game would be the site of a competitive interaction. Now, game theory includes more than the theory of competitive, interact, competitive social interactions. It also includes a large body of of literature about cooperative interactions. And a cooperative game would be modeled, would be exemplified by something like Monopoly, where um, you would have four players, not just two players, but in Monopoly, the individuals can talk to each other, and they can make deals, and they can make side payments, and they can own properties together, and they can split the earnings from the properties. And whereas in something like chess, the two individuals can't talk to each other, can't make deals, you know, and uh, it's, it's highly constricted. Now, if we start at the individual level, then it's quite possible to imagine that the outcome of the social dynamics at involving one or two, or involving two or three or four individuals could be cooperative, and the outcome could be a cooperative solution rather than a competitive solution. And the outcome of a game like Monopoly um, and, uh, the outcome would be quite different, if you think about it, if the individuals, imagine the four players at a Monopoly game, suppose they couldn't talk to one another, suppose they couldn't make deals inside payments, you would get a certain outcome to, to that game when it was being played. Now change the rules of the game and imagine that they can make deals inside payments. You'll get a different kind of outcome out of it. Now the kinds of outcomes that come out of uh, cooperative games are different and a, a superset of those that come out of competitive games. And by uh, taking this approach to the evolution of social behavior, starting at the individual and building up, you can bring into uh, the discussion cooperative game theory from the beginning. Whereas in the, com in the uh, uh, old fashioned, pro the approach from Maynard Smith, you're stuck with competitive uh, dynamics in the first place because the ESS, the evolutionarily stable strategy, is a competitive solution. And the, and the dynamics within the gene pool are competitive. And so if you're stuck assuming that the behavior has to, the behavioral dynamics has to mirror the gene pool dynamics in some way, then you're stuck with an essentially competitive picture of social behavior. And that, um, um, that might not seem to be a problem, but if, if in fact that's not consistent with the data, then, um, uh, then it is a problem. Now, here's how um, we're imagining that the social dynamics takes place. So we're, let's talk now just about the behavioral tier and about two kinds of social organizations that occur within the behavioral tier. Then I'll get to the evolutionary tier uh, after discussing two types of social organization within the behavioral tier. Now, the first type we've spent a lot of time thinking about is uh, the idea of a team, of teamwork, and of pleasure-based teamwork. So the proximal motivation for individuals to work together in a team is shared pleasure, reciprocated physical pleasure. 
and, and it revolves around social, around intimacy. And so here you see primates where there's a lot of intimate social interact, intimate social contact right here. Um, in this case, it's heterosexual uh, physical contact. But I have in mind more than just physical contact. I'm assuming that there's pleasure experienced also in singing together or in working together, in acting together. So that uh, uh, to, to choose a human analogy, um, in basketball, uh, it's possible to score a basket by, uh, by having a nice, a, 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 a nice acrobatic move, such as the alley-oop pass. Imagine one individual passes off to the other who, who throws the uh, ball into the basket and, and uh, while catching it in midair and dunks it into the basket. And everybody's ecstatic about that. And there's a sense of pleasure to executing uh, the, the action as a joint action. Now contrast that with uh, getting two foul shots. Two foul shots also just gets two points, but it's no fun. And you come away just with the same two points. Now what's being valued in something like an alley-oop pass is an additional degree of pleasure a pleasure associated with getting the two points as a joint action. And it's similar also in another human example to soccer. You've seen in soccer where if one player kicks the ball and then another pick gets it on the, on, um, as it's moving and then kicks it into the goal, you get this combination play which gets a goal. And compare that to the anticlimax of, of penalty shots at the end of the game where just to break a tie, Individuals just kick a goal against the other, and somebody comes away the winner, and you say, oh, too bad, you know, somebody had a win, but it's no fun. And so I'm postulating, hypothesizing, that there is a sense of physical pleasure associated with accomplishing a task jointly. And that's testable, of course, with the kind of methodology which looks at neurological pleasure centers and sees whether or not pleasure centers, centers are excited uh, when actions are carried out jointly. Now, what kinds of actions could cause pleasure? Um, there are physical intimacy like this, and also I'm assuming that, or hypothesizing that verbal int intimacy, such as interlocking calls between birds, can also lead to a sense of happiness or joy by the participants, and not unlike singing in a human choir. And the physical intimacy is a real, is, is one of the major ways, though. And I have a, a, a sequence right here of physical intimacy, which is same-sex physical intimacy, from lions. Okay, so here are two lions. So the, these are shot in the Serengeti by a Brazilian uh, news photographer who was on vacation. And he shot a sequence of slides of two... Uh, lions approaching each other and sharing, as you'll see, an intimate moment. And he was so amazed at this that he brought the slides to a magazine, which is the Brazilian equivalent of Time magazine, and they in turn published it. And I was at uh, one of these TEDx meetings in the Amazon last year, and the uh, fellow that the photo photographer gave the slides to came up to me and said, you have to have these slides, you have to have them. And I took them and, and spliced them together into this little uh, movie right here. And this is pretty amazing. So here are the two lions uh, coming to uh, they are seeing one of them approaches the other and then nuzzles it. If you have cats, you've seen them do that. Um, and then moves over here. and then sp sprawls out. And this one comes to it. And mounts it. And so here we have a same-sex mating going on. And obviously these are hard to detect in the field because uh, you'd actually have to see this happening. You can't 
um, do a paternity analysis, so to speak, and find out that uh, offspring have been produced. And these are quite rare to occur. But as you may know, of course, lions work together in teams. And um, so I'm hypothesizing that these various kinds of uh, social uh, uh, intimacies occur, both physical and vocal, and that they uh, permit teamwork to occur. Now, there are two main elements to teamwork as I'm envisioning it. One is that both parties work together, so they're working uh, in combination with each other. They work jointly, so they're coordinated. There's coordinated action by both parties. And secondly, they work toward a common goal. Now, the way that we've been modeling that would be in a setup of, of this sort. This would then be the game being played at one spot and this would be a payoff matrix uh, associated with the game at that one spot. So one of these, this could be a male and this could be the female, and this could be the payoff that each get uh, as a function of allocating time between going out to catch food versus sitting at the nest and guarding it. And so the male and the female have to negotiate uh, how much time each would spend catching food versus guarding the nest. And this numerical example is taken from a textbook by Straffin, and I just simply use these numerical, um, this numerical example as an illustration. But the way this would be played, if this is the male and the female right here, the way this would be played if they were competing with each other, if uh, the male and the female was each in competition with the other in some sense, trying to get the other to do all of the work. And uh, you'd find this, th this type of uh, uh, outcome here, that uh, this would be the playoff to this player, and the second column is the playoff to, to the top player, Cyan. Now, regardless of where they start, if, if for example, red was doing most of the uh, egg, this could be um, egg, this could be uh, guarding the egg, and this could be foraging. And similarly here, if it turns out that this one was doing the guarding, and this one was, was catching the, the food, this would be the payoff situation. Now, Six is greater than five here, so the 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 tendency for this uh, player would be to 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 change its allocation of effort and to move over to this slot to this location. And similarly, if this had been the initial locate uh, allocation, then the this player would also cyan would also move from two over to one from catching food over to guarding. And once they were both in this set of allocations, then this player would, would move in this direction, winding up, I'm sorry, would move in this direction, winding up in this lower left-hand corner, because four is greater than two. So the net effect of playing competitively, where each one only does what's best for it, would be to wind up with this allocation of effort in which the 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 one individual would do the guarding would do the foraging and the other individual would do the feeding and this would be the payoffs that they would they would receive as a result so that's the outcome that you would expect under competition and that would be the so-called Nash competitive equilibrium named after John Nash now there's another possibility if they were playing cooperatively there's another whole possibility and you can imagine that, uh, in particular, um, th this individual, the red individual, could say at this point that I'm not really happy down here because all I'm doing is getting f a payoff of four, four units of offspring. And could say that uh, I really would like to be up here where I was getting 10. And the other player could say, tough, um, that's not in my best interest. 
then what this player could do is to threaten. And to threaten means that this player would deliberately move over here. So instead of playing two, it would switch its allocation and play strategy number one. That would drop Cyan's earnings from eight to six. Okay. So that would be a threat. Now, it's interesting, the notion of a threat is interesting because it hurts the threader. The one who's doing the threatening is also hurt, but it hurts, hurts the one being threatened. Because, But if red is willing to do that enough, it establishes the, the threat as credible. And the analogy right here is to the notion of going out on strike. When John Nash was working on cooperative game theory, he had labor management negotiations as a, as a metaphor. And so in effect, uh, red is going on strike and hurting itself, but also hurting management. And when that happens, that creates an incentive then for management to bargain. Management could then say, or Cyan could say, well, okay, I'll do this some of the time so that you can come out with a 10 some of the time. But you can't do it too much but you can do it some of the time, in return for which you stop threatening. So that's the deal. They have to be able to talk to one another and so on in order to pull this off. And the best compromise uh, right here, there's a technical criterion that Nash introduced for it, so you can compute what the best compromise is. And it's this green, green dot over here called the Nash bargaining solution. And NCE, which is the brown dot, that's the Nash competitive equilibrium. So this is a graph right here of the payoff to player one, the payoff to player two. This is where they'd wind up if they were playing competitively. And the Nash bargaining solution is where it'd be nice if they wound up, uh, if they could somehow um, get there. That's the, the best, best solution. Now Nash was silent on how the Nash bargaining solutions realized. It's an interesting problem because the question of the mechanism by which the bargaining solution is realized then is left unspecified. And so we've hypothesized that this notion of team play is, uh, and seeking uh, shared pleasure is a mechanism by which the Nash bargaining solution would be realized. And so we've introduced equations here for that um, which I don't want to go into in a lot of detail, other than to, than to say that uh, if they're playing competitively, each one is climbing its own. This is a gradient right here. This is the fitness of the two players. And this partial derivative right here represents the gradient in fitness. So this one changes its allocation to maximize, the, uh, to climb its gradient of fitness. So they're independent gradient climbers. In contrast, if they're playing cooperatively, then there's a different gradient involved. There's the product of the two fitnesses, so they sense each other's welfare. One is happy if the other is happy. You actually have happiness through the combined welfare. And then this then is a partial derivative. This is then the gradient of the joint welfare. And the X's instead of the Y's right here, what these refer to is that they take steps jointly to maximize the joint welfare. And so they jointly then climb the gradient of the team fitness function. And this we're hypothesizing is what's going on in teamwork, and it leads to a cooperative outcome. And that can be tested, of course, and is now modeled. Now the other kind of structure that we have in mind. So in addition to firm, uh, to teams, the other type of structure we have in mind at the behavioral tier are firms. And, and so our concept of a family unit is that it is, so to speak, a firm, using the economic word, whose product is offspring. The job of the male and the female together is to produce offspring. And so we went to um, the economic literature of industrial organization to find out how firms would be organized. Now, a firm differs from a team in that, that uh, one of the entities involved is assumed to con have control over the, over 
the resources and over the rest. So uh, the, the idea is that the, the owner of the company is in a position to set the salaries to the workers. And, and in setting the salaries, the, and in, the owner is in a position to set up an, in, an incentive structure so that the, the workers tell the owner the truth as opposed to lying and trying to, to get away with murder. So our idea of a firm is a parent offspring firm of a firm is the simplest example would be the parent offspring relation. And here's a picture of the parent offspring firm in which the parent gets food and it controls how much food it's going to give to the offspring. Now, in as some of you may know in parental investment theory, there's been a lot of discussion about the possibility of parent offspring conflict. And the idea of firm, the theory of the firm here is that the parent's in a position to minimize parent-offspring conflict and also sib-sib conflict because that's inefficient. And from the parent's point of view, fitness is wasted when um, there's parent-offspring conflict and, so to speak, money is left on the table or fitness is left on the table. And so they, it would be in the interest of the parent to set up an incentive structure which minimizes this kind of conflict. And one of the simplest and sort of most ingenious uh, incentive structures is for the parent to auction the food to the offspring. Uh, and if there's several offspring, to auction it to, the, uh, to each one of them. And here's the way this goes. This is a so-called Walsian auction, where the parent can set the price of the food. Now, what is the price of the food? Now, the, if the nestlings are begging and making noise, there could be a certain amount of food that the parent gives per unit begging. The parent can decide, well, if you just squawk a little bit, I'll give you a gram of food, or if you squawk a little bit, I'll only give you a half gram of food. The parent can decide how much food to give per unit squawking. And the um, and in that sense, set the price of the food. And in this setup right here, the 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 chick has to convey to the parent what its so-called demand function is, which is how much food it would want for any given price. So the idea here is that if a chick, if food is cheap, well then the chick will go ahead and get a lot of it. But if it has to squawk a whole lot for a little bit of food, then uh, it doesn't want as much. The demand function is the curve of how much food it optimally wants for any, any given price. So if the chick communicates this to the parent, the parent can then say, okay, well now I know how much food I would have to deliver. Um, and then the parent can be in a position to say, well, now it's going to take me a certain amount of risk to go get this food. So what I'll do is set a price that would lead the chick to beg for exactly as much as I want to give it. Okay, you get that? So that because the parent's in control. But at that point, that's an interesting equilibrium point because that's the point at which the chick is getting what it wants, given the price. So it's an optimal solution from the chick's point of view, given the price. But it's also optimal from the parent's point of view because it set the price. So it's a situation in which you have all the conflict resolved. There's no conflict there, no parent offspring conflict. And if, if you work this out for two kids, two, two chicks, there's no chick-chick conflict either. But, um, there's no, but it differs from a team and that no one's working together. The parent is controlling the whole operation. So there's no shared pleasure or uh, anything like this. Here they're just working competitively with one another. It's just that the, the, the competitively optimal strategies have been made to coincide by this judicious arranging of uh, uh, incentives. And so we've worked all this out in quite some detail now. This is in press. 
um, this would be, for example, the optimal demand curve for a chick, for an you know, explicit model of a chick growing. This is price, that is how much food you get per unit begging. This is um, the amount of food delivered. And for a, a large chick, it would have this demand curve. For a small chick, it has this demand curve. So a small chick is demanding more than a large chick. A uh, small chick is hungrier. And now what's interesting is that a model like this can be very explicit about uh, when, uh, about how the chick grows and above all about when the chick is weaned. Because uh, here, for example, would be the, per, the, per, the parental fitness production function and the horizontal axis is price. So this is what the parent sees as the best price from its point of view, which it then sets for the chick. So for a small chick, this would be the uh, price that the parent would charge. And as the chick um, grows, it's actually charging less because the chick is less hungry. <laughs> Still wants to give it a certain amount of food. Now, eh, now here's the, if you add to this model the ability of the chick to get its own food, then uh, the shape of the curve starts to change. If the chick can get enough food of its own, then there's no peak to this curve anymore. And the best price is the maximum price at which the chick no longer wants anything. If the parent sets it too high, the chick doesn't want it. He says, enough. And you can find mathematically a point at which this peak disappears. And that peak, when the peak disappears, is then a, a, an exact criterion for when the weaning should take place. And, and then, then the chick is weaned. And you see, it, and I call that the weaning threshold. And along the horizontal axis here, we have time. This is the trajectory of the chick growing. And as the chick grows, its size passes this certain threshold at which this peak disappears. And at this point, the parent should kick the chick out of the nest. But also, the chick should willingly fly out of the nest. So that's the point at which the weaning occurs. And so you could make, in principle, extend this a lot to make a whole model of family dynamics based on the theory of the firm. And and then this is, of course, the social structure that would evolve by natural selection because this is the social structure that maximizes the fitness production by the parent. And so you don't even need special kinds of selection. This will just um, evolve by ordinary Darwinian natural selection. So my picture then for the parent-parent relationship is that physical intimacy produces team play between the two parents resolving genetic conflict, and that the parent-offspring relationship is mediated by the parent controlling the incentives to the offspring. Now the reason for going through this right here, the parent-parent and the parent-offspring stuff, is that remember the logic to the social selection program begins at the end, namely the raising of offspring, and works back to the, the mating. So we'll get to the mating shortly. Now, before getting there, though, I just want to mention the evolutionary tier. So, for the evolutionary tier, we're not focusing on an individual game anymore, but on the whole collection of games. Now, uh, just briefly, this is how you do that. What you do is you make, if you were doing it in a one locus, two allele setup, you make uh, a table of all the possible matchups between, say, different genotypes. Each genotype right here codes for a, a different payoff matrix. So now we're going to look at the evolution of the payoff matrices themselves. We're not going to assume that you have a given payoff matrix, but you could have genetic variation in payoff matrices. And so if these are the different possible matchups, then if P, if, for example, is the frequency of the A1 allele, then this would be the table of all of the, all the matchups and all the frequencies. And this would then be the offspring production from each one of the possible uh, matchups. The idea is, of course, that you never know who you're going to be playing with. And so 
you'd have to, when you aggregate over the whole population, you have to aggregate over all the possible um, partners you might wind up having to share your nest with. And the best strategy would, would be the one which performs the best in games averaged over all the kinds of partners you might find yourself playing with. And you don't want to assess the adaptive significance of one strategy only in one instance of a game. You want to be able to assess it over the ensemble of games it could appear in. And so this would be the payoff from each one of, to each party in each one of the matchups. You add all that stuff up, and you get in the sense of usual good old population genetics an equation for the gene frequency at time t plus 1 is a function of the column totals from the gene frequencies at time t. And in this way, you can directly model the evolution of the payoff matrix itself, starting from, say, this configuration and evolving through time to this configuration, <coughs> which would have this kind of picture of... Uh, payoffs. So the evolutionary tier is not really all that interesting in social selection theory. It just simply makes a connection between the behavioral tier and the evolution we've all grown to know and love. But the real action, the new modeling and the new, the new I think, uh, empirical work and testing lies within the behavioral tier and taking behavioral behavior seriously as a first class element in the theory and not starting with a gene pool, but sort of working toward the gene pool rather than from the gene pool. Now, as I mentioned, the other way in which social selection differs from sexual selection has to do with starting with the offspring and working back to mating rather than starting with mating and working forward. So this is the part of our work which has had the least development so far. And all I really have to offer here for you are some ideas, not some models. So it's just it's, it's where we're at. Now, uh, so these now we come to the traits that, that really interest that, that has classically interested the sexual selectionists a whole lot, the ornaments and the armaments that the animals have. Now it seems to me, and I'm going to suggest, that the ornaments can be classified into two kinds. Ornaments that or actions, and I include behavior as, behaviors as ornaments as well. Those which are chi, and which seem to only function in signaling, and those that are expensive. And by the cheap trade, the cheap ornaments, I'd like to illustrate that with a bird I've just become very enchanted with, the Laysan albatross right here, which live in Kauai, where I now live. And... Uh, I took took this picture, and they were in they they live in an area of Kauai at the moment, which is a residential development called Princeville. So you actually have to walk on people's yards, front yards, to take that picture, you know. And they just drive around them, and the bird just sit there. I feel very uncomfortable doing that. I don't think that's the the best site for taking uh, for doing a long term study. But anyway, you can go up and see them there. Now here's a picture of their courtship display. Now, um, see, this is, a, uh, this is a juvenile right here. These two birds uh, are probably not, they probably didn't mate for this season. They're trying to find a mate now for the next season. The, and if this were breeding time, you wouldn't have the, uh, the, the juveniles around. Now, We've started modeling this kind of phenomenon on the following hypothesis, that what's going on here is a, a negotiation that you might think of as a, a prenuptial agreement. 
So they already know in this habitat what's involved in raising eggs. Okay, we've already done the egg ra raising part. We know what social infrastructure ought to be. But now they have to find partners with whom they share the same opinion about what to do. And so if one assumes that there's a system of courtship <coughs> semantics, so that each one of these motions right here corresponds to uh, a, a meaning, a meaning such as, well, under the following circumstances, I'll go catch food, or under the following circumstances, I'll go uh, guard the young, then something like this, now they could be, something like this could represent going through a discussion of what each, what each will undertake as the work to be done when they get around to raising young. And so on my account, they're not showing off genes or anything of that sort. They're not, no one's trying to find the best mate. Instead, what they're trying to do is to hammer out an agreement. There's no notion of a best mate. There's an, there is a notion of who you agree with. And, and so I interpret when there are little squabbles. I'm not interpreting this as any in, uh, manifestation of genetic conflict, but as a manifestation instead of different perceptions about what would be best to do. Because even if they're working together, they're sharing mutual pleasure and they're working together as a team, they still have seen different things as they grew up. Each one might have a different assessment of what the predation risk is, or a different assessment of what the food abundance is. There's no reason to think that even birds that are, so to speak, committed to working together and enjoy each other's pleasure and each other's welfare, there's no reason to agree that they, or to assume that they both agree on what should be done. And, it, and I'm intent seeing the courtship right here as one of trying to find a partner with whom you can make an agreement on how to make, how to raise the offspring that you're going to then jointly raise. And if you can't come to an agreement, well then they don't continue. They don't continue, not because of genetic compatibility or anything of that sort, they don't continue because they didn't have the same opinion about what's best to do. And there are pictures you can see on YouTube and other sources in which they'll interact for a while and then uh, disengage and go interact with somebody else. And sometimes it can be three of them that are interacting and so it's been taking opinions. Now, this would be another example of, a, of an inexpensive trait, the badge on a collared flycatcher right here, which has been widely studied, and I've cited it a lot in my previous work, as a great example of a so-called failed poster child species for sexual selection. There was a whole body of literature that females were supposed to prefer these badges as symbols of good, as symbols of good genes, and a great 24-year study published in Nature showed that this was entirely incorrect, leaving it un unknown what the function of the badge was. Well, of course, my opinion is that the function of the badge is, is to be used in signaling and signaling somehow in connection with these premarital agreements. But that differs from the other kind of ornaments, such as on the elephant seal right here. Great big thing. And of course, the famous peacock tail. And these ornaments are supposed to be used to attract females. Now, and a female is supposed to choose the male on the basis of these traits. Now, again, there's an awful lot of counter evidence that the females are indifferent to these. The females don't really care about the tail after all. And uh, so it's just very hard to maintain the classic interpretation of these traits involving female choice or male-male competition for access to females. As I say, because there's often female indifference to the trait. Or in the case of this trait, if males are fighting with each other, and the there are nice pictures of these elephant seals fighting each other and hurting each other occasionally. It's the tusks that do the hurting, not this thing. And it's not clear that female elephant seals care about these things. So what's the function? What's a possible other function of these traits? Now, the typical explanation for why they're expensive 
would be to appeal to Fisher's uh, runaway theory, th theory of runaway selection, in which there's basically a co-evolution of the elaborateness and expensiveness of the trait with female preference. So the females are supposed to increasingly want uh, a big gaudy tail. The male's supposed the male's tail is supposed to get bigger, and then the preference is supposed to grow, and the tail's supposed to get bigger, and you get this runaway positive feedback kind of process in which both the preference and the tail extensiveness increase as a co-evolutionary co act, act, action. And now the problem, I think, empirically with that is that that if the females are indifferent to the trait, then then they haven't co-evolved a strong preference. They don't care about it. So another possibility would be now here, let me show you this. This is a this is how a peacock mates. So see if you see if this female really cares about that tail. <laughs> Notice it's the back of the of the male that's aimed at the peahen. So it just jumps on. It's not like the female, you know, cased the male out, you know, and said, ah, you're the one for me. And then, and that's not an isolated example. I, I have another one. You hear that little squeal beforehand? And so when when you look at this, do you really think the standard story is plausible? I mean, apart from the fact that there are actually scientific studies that show the absence of female preference for all these complicated patterns, do you really buy it? Because I think it's kind of hard to buy into the story when you actually see the way the maidens occur. Because it's not like you go to a jewelry store and you look at all the pieces of jewelry and you figure out the one that you want to wear on, on your ear or something. So my suggestion instead is, is an intraspecific counterpart, if you will, of the Fisher runaway theory. Fisher runaway theory is, involves the coevolution of the male and the female preference. But the suggestion I've been making for a number of years that we haven't had a chance to model it yet much, is that these large these expensive characters are used as admission tickets by males to join power holding cliques. And in the case of the peacock and the elephant seal, it's males that have them, but I also think these can be carried, these admission ticket traits can be carried by females, and I was especially led to this idea when looking at the spotted hyena, in which, as you may know, the females have penises. And this is a very bizarre trait, of course, and, and, but these penises are used and are erected by the females to one another when they, uh, when they need to uh, re-bond after having been separated for a while or if there's been a disagreement. And, and so, in order to function as a female spotted hyena, you need to have one of these. And similarly, the, the peacock tail, and I, in Kauai, we have roosters in the yard, and I can look at them. Who, who cares about a rooster? A hen doesn't care about a rooster. Roosters cock-a-doodle-doo. Every morning we're awakened to a cock-a-doodle-doo, and the rooster's talking to other roosters. And, and the idea, therefore, is that these these traits are really valued by males in male-male interaction. And if you don't have these traits, you're not eligible to participate or allowed to participate in the power-holding cliques that occur at these leks. 
And when there are groups of males like this, it's called a lick. And uh, so that's my hypothesis about that, but this is where uh, our work so far is uh, not very developed. Priya Iyer, who was my last graduate student, did a chapter of her thesis on the evolution of uh, uh, tickets, um, admission tickets. So um, that's social selection, therefore. Uh, it differs from sexual selection and having uh, reverse the direction of inference from the individual to the population and also from the end of the breeding cycle from the last stage in the life history to mating as an earlier stage. And a lot of those ideas are contained in these books. Evolution's Rainbow, published in 2004, is a survey of gender and sexuality in the animal kingdom and also has a lot of anthropology in it. This has now been translated into Korean and Portuguese and my most recent book, The Genial Gene, has now been translated into French and will actually be available shortly. And finally, my, I've been blessed to have the collaboration of Errol Ache, who's now a postdoc at Princeton, and Priya Iyer, who's uh, returned to take a faculty position in India. So, thank you very much. There's some questions. Uh, that's about cheating. So why, is it, you gave an example of peacock, uh, what drives the males not to cheat on that whole, you know, why participate in the election system amongst males if you could simply be a uh, cryptic? Oh, well, uh, well that's, that is, in, in the work with, uh, with Priya, that is a possibility. So, so first of all, I mean, the other males can kick you out. And, and as you know, uh, the, the cryptic males are, are kicked out. Uh, and um, so the question is how to get in without uh, paying the expense of the trade. Um, and so you can work out conditions under which, it, it, if it's not all that expensive to, uh, to have the trade, then you might as well get it. But if the trade is very expensive, that's what opens the door for the evolution of a morph which tries to circumvent the admission ticket and try to, to cheat. So, uh, and as, as you know, there are systems in which there are, there's, there, there are ornamented males and then sometimes there are non-ornamented males um, and sometimes there's several morphs of non-ornamented males and uh, our modeling has not gotten that far. I'm wondering about um, the, the strike analogy. Yeah. And I, I imagine that uh, you know that four cell box where you had uh, cooperation yeah. and altruism, and, and the fourth one that was never happening was spike. Yeah. And that's what you were describing. So. I was describing spike. Yeah. That's right, the uh, levying of a credible threat would appear to be spite because it hurts the one carrying out the threat as well as the one being threatened. And so this would also then be a model for the evolution spite. But the spite would have to be, um, well, it's still a hypothesis. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's true. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, but on this model, uh, th this would be a model for the evolution of spite. But it would have to be, according to this model, brief and followed by a reconciliation leading to a cooperative outcome. So you couldn't have continued spite according to this model. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to follow that up to these models, kind of like the prisoners of women and the evolution of philosophers depend on repeated interactions where they view you know, so that they're cooperative yeah. then they have to be repeated interactions. So how does that work in this model? Well, um, I, I don't get into the one-shot versus repeated interaction taxonomy because I have them working together. <clears throat> now, you could say that that was almost an instantaneous repeat because of when the animals are working together um, as, a, as a team, you could say that they were repeatedly interacting. But, but I, I'm not sure that's a helpful taxonomy. Um, because it, it's still, the way game theorists talk is they, 
they implicitly assume a logical priority to competition. And I've gotten into really quite a nasty argument about this with Binmore, a guy named Binmore, who's a game theorist, and wrote an attack on uh, me. And I uh, just have coming out in JEB at the moment uh, a rebuttal. And it may already be available together with a, re a review of the whole theory of bargaining and pleasure, which we, we've introduced. But he, he insists, along with other game theorists, that a cooperative outcome like the Nash bargaining solution be attained with a back and forth dickering. And they have fancy schemes. The game theorists have fancy schemes for, for how different back and forth dickerings can converge to a Nash bargaining solution. And they like that uh, because for some reason, which I feel is ideological on their part, they feel that competition, that you have to achieve cooperation via harnessing competition somehow. The competition is prior, logically prior. And I just don't accept that. I don't see any grounds to accept it, and they don't offer any grounds. I mean, I'd be willing to have them argue me into it, but they take it as a matter of a precondition to the discussion that competition is more fundamental. Now, uh, and they, and Binmore goes out of his way even to say that I'm being non-Darwinian. And I can't imagine where he comes up with that, because there is the gene pool, there are genes, and I, I've been working for 40 years with, the, with Darwinian natural selection. But at the phenotypic level, that's another matter. You know, we don't, we could have cooperation at the phenotypic level, which uh, evolves through ordinary natural selection. But what you see is cooperation. You don't see genes, you see phenotypes cooperating. And I think there's a possibility that uh, a third way, if you will, that, that a lot of the games, to, a lot of people aren't thinking about, which is that you could have the cooperative or the social development of the phenotype. Because typically in evolutionary theory, we, we, we take the gene and then the phenotype, right? And then it's a one-to-one -one mapping or something. You have the phenotype out here. But the phenotype forms, it develops. And, and so we know, for example, that if you have two embryo in a common uterus, that the hormones released by one can affect the other. There's a birth order effect, uh, for example, in human physical characteristics. And, uh, and, and so just as you could have shared a shared chemical environment affecting the development of the individuals in that environment, you could have a shared social environment affecting phenotypic development. But at the end of the day, it's still individual selection. You have had uh, a social development of the phenotype, but it's still, at the individual level, you produced a certain number of offspring, and the other individual produced a certain number of offspring. And what teamwork is about, basically, is the social development of cooperative phenotypes mediated by, by pleasure. And you come out of it, and for, I mean, again, to take a, a human sports example, you come out of playing on a good team different than you went into it, but you've learned how to cooperate, and you have a different phenotype through the experience <coughs> of cooperation on a good team. And so then you can make the alley you pass, and you know how to do these. You have a capability. Um, and because of that capability, you're able to have a large number of offspring. And that's what, um, I'm mad, it's that kind of process which I'm drawn to, and not this sort of game theory-like talk about, well, you play it once, or you play it a couple times, because they're still atomizing the players. And, and it, in this more social picture, you don't have atomic players anymore, you actually have shared development, even though you do have individual fitnesses. See what I'm saying? So. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs>